bright duty every student matters now one of the important aspect of revolt of 1857 or the sepoy mutiny is that the revolt was shaped by rumors uh, that was spread during that time among the indians among the british okay so now let us look at some of the rumors and prophecies one of the features as i already said was that rumors played a significant role in moving the people in inspiring the people in encouraging the people to support the revolt against the british okay for example when the sepoys from meerut Uh, reached Delhi, they told Bahadur Shah that the bullets supplied to supplied to them were coated with the fat of cows and pigs. Okay, which they had to bite before firing, and now this would corrupt their caste and religion. Okay. the british officers tried to explain the sepoys that this was not the case but the but the rumor of the bullets being coated with the fats of pigs and cows uh, that spread in all sepoy lines of northern india so from bengal it spread all across the northern part of india okay uh, another rumor was spread by captain wright commandant of rifle instruction depot he reported that in the third week of january 1857 a low caste khalasi who worked in a magazine in dumdum had asked a brahman sepoy to give him some water from his load this is not needed so uh, this rumor which was spread okay along the uh, military among the military among the sepoys among the indian sepoys we do not know whether this rumor was correct or not okay but once this rumor rumor was started it spread all across the region of north india and the british officers could not do anything to stop the spread of the rumor okay and the rumor what it did it spread fear among the sepoys now all the sepoys were scared that by using the bullets they would they would uh, their purity of the caste and religion would now become affected okay so now they became scared and many of them became angry Uh, with the british officers for providing them with bullets cartridges that were coated with pigs uh, and cows fat okay so this spread widely and the british could not do anything about it okay another rumor which was spread during this time was that of a conspiracy british conspiracy to destroy the caste and religion of the hindus and muslims so this was another uh, rumor that was spread among the people okay so how uh, the british were uh, coating the bullets uh, with the fats of cows and pigs on the uh, that were to be used by the uh, indian sepoys and another uh, rumor was that the british had been mixing the dust of cows and pigs bones into the flour that was sold in the market and this flour was consumed by the indian sepoys right so uh, this was uh, another rumor and because of this rumor uh, they were they were panicked all right they were scared and uh, there was also another rumor uh, which said that the british wanted to convert the indians to christianity so you can understand the kind of rumors that were being spread and that caused fear and panic among the indian soldiers okay the british again tried to remove their fear they tried to uh, find ways to remove their fear and clear all these uh, misconceptions but they all went in vain because the rumors had already caused great amount of anger among the indians and they had already now uh, risen against the british in revolt all right and there was also a prophecy okay a prophecy is something which is believed to uh, come to true believed to come to true okay uh, which is believed to uh, believed to happen in a certain amount of time 
all right so there was a prophecy and this was also spread among the indian sepoys and the indians and that prophecy said that in in a period of a year in a period of a year uh, from in a period of a year from the time when the battle of plaza was fought which was in uh, which was in 1757 all right so within a year from that uh, period for, uh, within a year from the time the battle of plaza was fought uh, that would be the day that would be the time when the british rule would come to an end so such prophecy also helped uh, spread okay such prophecy also spread among the indians and that shaped the revolt of 1857 okay now what is interesting about these prophecies and the rumors that were shaped is that of course that shaped the nature of the revolt of 1857 but we do not know if these rumors were true or false if these rumors were correct or incorrect but what these rumors tell us is the minds of the people okay it tells us about the minds of the people what people believed okay their fears what they were scared of their faiths their belief okay their understanding all right and rumors what do they do they express they reflect they show the fears and suspicions of the people okay they showed how people were scared they showed how a uh, panic uh, was spread amongst the amongst the indians and now they felt that they had to come together and get rid of the british rule all right now when we try to understand these rumors that were being spread we have to try to understand how these rumors began okay why were these rumors coming up and being spread so for that we have to study the policies that the british government followed in the late 1820s okay before the 1857 before the revolt all right governor general lord william bentinck adopted policies which aimed at reforming bringing change in the indian society so he brought or he tried to bring changes in the indian society by introducing western education by introducing western ideas and western institutions okay and with support and cooperation from some indian reformers okay uh, in the indian society he established english medium schools colleges universities and propagated or spread liberal ideas okay uh, the british passed also laws the british government also passed uh, he also passed laws to abolish some of the indian uh, customs like sati burning of the uh, burning of the wife when the husband died in his funeral pyre so these customs were abolished okay and uh, another tradition another custom of remarrying hindu uh, or or prohibition of uh, remarriage of hindu uh, widows so uh, the governor general or the government also abolished uh, some evils that were present in the indian society like for example the custom of sati where the uh, wife were to burn herself in the funeral pyre of the husband okay if the husband died before her and there was another custom which was that uh, hindu widows were not allowed to remarry so this uh, custom was also abolished okay now when these changes were being introduced when laws were being passed to bring changes in the indian society okay to make some progression in the indian society the indians the people felt that the british they were trying to destroy their social religious customs that they were trying to replace the indian customs with something which is oppressive which is alien which is unknown and which is impersonal they have no connection with them okay so this made them have or cultivate a suspicion okay that the activities of the christian missionaries were were targeted 
to bring changes in the religion of the people. They were targeting to uh, convert the Hindus into Christianity, to convert the Muslims into Christianity. Okay, so these conditions, these policies, okay, uh, which were followed by the British government in the first half of the 19th century allowed rumors, allowed fears, allowed suspicions and apprehensions to spread among the Indians very quickly. Okay, so these uh, background, these acted as backgrounds for the rumors to develop among the people and spread and that allowed them to all come together out of fear to fight against the British. Okay. Now let's look at another uh, place, Awad, okay, one of the places. Let's look at one of the places where the revolt was very strong. Okay. The kingdom of Awad was situated in the territory between Sarju, a tributary of Ganges, to the northwest of Allahabad. It was situated on the bank of uh, river Sarju uh, in the northwestern part of Allahabad. Now, the British occupied Awad in stages. Okay, In 1801, it imposed something called subsidiary alliance on uh, Awad. Now, according to this alliance, according to this uh, policy, what the ruler or the Nawab of Awad had to do was he had to disband his military force, allow the British forces to station in the kingdom, in his kingdom, and act according to the advice of the British resident. Okay, A British officer officer were now part of the court of the uh, ruler of Awad and he would provide advices to the ruler for the administration of Awad. So basically now the Nawab of Awad had to act according to the British resident. Okay. Now the now the ruler of uh, ruler of Awad was deprived of his armed forces. He had no armed forces. It was the British forces who were stationed. Okay, so the Nawab gradually became dependent upon the British to maintain law and order within his kingdom. He could no more assert his authority over his rebellious chiefs and the Talukdars. So basically, what did subsidiary alliance do? It made the British. Uh, it made Made the British uh, resident the ruler of Awad. Okay, although Nawab or the ruler of, of Awad existed, uh, he became a puppet in the hands of the British resident. He had to act according to the advices of the British resident. Okay, and the British resident would now take care of the administration, uh, maintain law and order. Okay, so the Nawab now were com was completely dependent upon the British government. Okay, now after that, after the introduction of subsidiary alliance in uh, Awad, the British government was not satisfied. Okay, he, uh, the British government wanted to acquire the territory of Awad now have complete authority and control over Awad, okay? And why uh, did the British government want Awad? Because it was good for producing indigo and cotton, very important cash crops which was exported, which were exported to the European markets, okay? Moreover, this region was ideally located for the development of a principal market of Upper India. It was a very uh, important uh, place for the development of the market, of a uh, good market, okay, or for the economy of uh, the northern part of India, okay. By the early 1850s, the British had become masters of the Maratha lands and the central India, the Karnatic, the Punjab and Bengal. So by 1850s, now British had gained control over the lands of Marathas, the central India, the Karnatic, the Punjab as well as Bengal. Okay. So the occupation of Awadh in 1856 was expected to complete the process of territorial expansion that the colonial power had begun with the conquest of Bengal about a century earlier. So as 
the government or the British government was following an expansionist policy. It was trying to expand its territory, bring more Indian territories under its control, under its authority, okay, extend its rule in India. So, Awad also was finally annexed uh, or occupied by the British government in 1856, okay. The Governor General of India, Lord Dalhousie's policy of wholesale annexations created dissatisfaction among the native rulers. Now, how the British government was annexing, was capturing one uh, city after another, one kingdom after another, this was not liked by the Indians. They were getting angrier. Okay, in 1851, he had described the kingdom of Awad as a cherry that will drop into our mouth one day. So, uh, Governor General Lord Dalhousie had said in 1851 that Awad was like a cherry, okay, which would drop into the mouth of the British government one day, meaning it would eventually be annexed uh, within and captured and become a part of the British uh, Empire. Okay. In 1856, Lord Dalhousie deposed, removed the ruler Wajid Ali Shah and uh, he exiled. Wajid Ali Shah now had to uh, go to Calcutta okay, and live there in exile. It was said that the Nawab was an unpopular ruler in Awadh and his, governments, his governance was not a good governance governance okay because of that reason the british government took control of awad from him but actually he was loved by his subjects that was not true okay now when he left lucknow many people followed him all the way to kanpur singing songs of lament so people were sad when wajid ali khan wajid ali shah uh, left lucknow for calcutta Okay, people expressed cry of agony, all right. Uh, they said that the life was gone of the body and the body had been left lifeless. There was no street or market and house which did not wail out of the cry of agony in separation of Jan E. Alam. Okay, so this was how the people expressed their pain, all right, when Wajid Ali Shah left uh, Awad for Calcutta. So this also led, uh, this also added to the anger of the Indians in Awadh, okay, against the British. So they were already getting angry uh, uh, towards the British, right, for capturing uh, Awadh. And now for removing uh, the ruler of Awadh, they became very angry, okay. So in Awadh, when the uh, revolt of 1857 took place, the revolt became an expression of popular of popular resistance to the foreign rule. So it became very strong. It became a necessity for the people to uproot the foreign rule, to do away with the foreign rule, to remove the foreign rule from Awad. Okay. Now with the annexation of Awad, when the British now captured, uh, had complete control over Awad, the government displaced the talukdars, the zamindars, the heads or the landlords, okay? In many villages, the talukdars had their estates and forts which they had held for many generations. So in villages, the talukdars had held their land, their fort, their houses for many generations, okay? They controlled the land and had some amount of power in the countryside which they exercised uh, there, okay? So before the coming of the British, the talukdars, they maintained their own army, and they enjoyed a certain degree of autonomy. They were free, okay? Uh, as long as they accepted the overlordship of Nawab and paid the revenue of their talukas. So in the countryside, the zamindars, the talukdars, the landlords, they were quite powerful, okay? Although they were under the, uh, under the rule of the Nawab, the ruler, they enjoyed certain amount of freedom. They could exercise power. All right. As long as they paid revenue to the Nawab, they were good. 
All right, but this did not happen. Okay. Uh, the British, when they came, when they came and controlled, had uh, when they uh, got full control of Awadh, they removed the Talukdars from that position of power. Okay, they could not tolerate the power of the Talukdars. All right, so they disarmed them. They forced them to get rid of their armed forces. All right, and they also demolished the forts and houses of the zamindars and talukdars. All right. Now the land revenue policy obviously was a setback to the position and authority of the talukdars. All right, the land policy, the land revenue policy, which the government, the British government, introduced in Awadh, also. Were, was uh, also affected the position enjoyed by the talukdars in Awadh. Okay, uh, so the British, the British government uh, introduced a land revenue settlement in 1856 called the Summary Settlement in Awadh. Okay, now the talukdars uh, who had established hold over the land for a long time, now they were assumed to be fraud. They were assumed to be not. Uh, they were assumed to be uh, collecting revenues. They were as, uh, they were assumed to be mis uh, misusing their power. Okay. So uh, the summary settlement. What this new uh, revenue settlement did? They removed the talukdars everywhere. Okay. In pre-British times, before the British had control over Awadh, the talukdars held sixty-seven percent of the total number of villages. All right, um, but by summary settlement, this went down to 38%. So you can imagine the amount of removal of the talukdars that was witnessed in Awadh. All right, so the talukdars of southern Awadh, they were the ones who were hit the most. Okay, some of them lost more than half of their total number of villages which they previously had. So some of the talukdars lost 50% of the land which they earlier had. Okay, now what the British government did was instead of the talukdars, it made the uh, peasants the owner of the soil. Okay. So they did this to remove the exploitation, the level of exploitation of the peasants. So they said that the talukdars were exploiting the peasants. If the talukdars were removed, then the uh, peasants would be directly under the British government, right? They would pay the uh, revenue directly to the British officers and not to the talukdars, all right? So that way, uh, the peasants would not be exploited and the revenue would also increase increase all right the revenue collection would also increase but this did not happen okay the revenue increased but the burden of revenue collection but the burden of uh, of the burden of revenue it fell on the peasants uh, wholly okay and uh, the demand and this burden did not reduce. This burden did not decrease. In fact, it increased. Okay. So as a result of this, you can see the new revenue, land revenue policy that was introduced in Awadh was neither good for the talukdars nor for the peasants. So neither the talukdars were happy with the British uh, land revenue policy nor were the peasants happy with it because both of them were severely affected by this new policy. Okay. Now, the disposition of talukdars broke down the entire social order. Now, the removal of talukdars from the position of power that they had before the British uh, annexation of Awadh, that broke down the social order as well. The ties of loyalty and patronage that had bound the peasants with the talukdars were shaken. The earlier, in the earlier times, the uh, before the British uh, control over Awadh, the talukdars had uh, certain bounds, uh, certain uh, bounds and certain ties with the uh, peasants. Now this also was broken and shaken. Okay. A 
Of course, many of the talukdars before the British came to our, they were oppressors and the, they exploited the peasants. But many of them were generous as well. Okay, they helped the peasants in times of need. But under the British, now such assistance and such guarantee for support to the peasants were no longer provided. Okay, because the British were only concerned with the collection of revenue and the demand for revenue was increasing and increasing on the uh, peasants all right and this also led to failures of crops and this also led to misery of the peasants and during the times of misery and hardship and crop failure uh, assistance was not provided to the peasants all right so when the revolt of 1857 took place, okay, in Awadh, the resistance, it was participated by the Talukdars, okay, and it was participated by the peasants as well because both were angry towards the British and both wanted to uproot the British, both wanted the British to go away, okay. Many of the Talukdars joined Begum Hazrat Mahal, okay, who was the wife of the ruler of uh, Awad in the fight against the British. Okay, uh, now the Sepoys, we know that it was mainly, it was first started by the Sepoys, the Indian soldiers, right? And we have seen that how in many places, places it was not only Sepoys. Like in Delhi, we saw as the Sepoys seized Delhi, there were others, cultivators, peasants and other people who joined the revolt, right? So we can see that even in Awad, the Sepoys were there who were uh, actively participating in the revolt. But it was also the Talukdars and peasants that provided support and actively participated in the river revolt. Okay. So the Sepoys also had their own complaints because of which they uh, were inspired by the Sepoys in Barakpur. They were inspired by Sepoys in Meerut and other places. Their complaints was that they were paid very low scale of payment they were provided low salaries okay and they were uh, they faced difficulty in getting leaves okay in getting holidays all right and there were other reasons uh, for which the sepoys uh, uh, fought against or uh, raised uh, uh, raised against the British and that was in the 1820s the white officers maintained friendly relations with the sepoys okay earlier the relationship between the sepoys and the British officials were friendly uh, they would take part in leisure activities like sports hunting etc they had wrestling uh, they fenced with them and went out hawking with them Okay, many of them spoke Hindustani fluently and there was familiarity within the British office officers uh, of the customs and cultures of the Indian sepoys. Okay, so they were uh, many times father figures to the sepoys. But this attitude, this friendly attitude, this uh, attitude of a fatherly figure changed uh, among the British officers in the 1840s. Now the British developed a sense of superiority and they started to treat their uh, soldiers uh, as their racial inferiors, as inferiors, okay? So the British officers were superiors and the Indian sepoys were uh, inferiors, okay? They were abused, the Indian soldiers were abused. Now there was a rift there was a gap, there was a distance that was created in the relationship, okay? And uh, the distance between the British soldiers, uh, British officers and the Indian sepoys grew, okay? Grew larger and larger. Now, there was no trust, uh, or there was no trust between these two. All right. So uh, one of the one of the uh, ways in which one of the incidents which caused which showed that they did not trust the Indian sepoys did not trust the British officers. Their British officers was the episode of the greased cartridges where they believed that the British had greased the bullets which they bit with their uh, which they bit with their mouth before inserting it into their guns 
bones uh, with cow and pig fats okay so that caused suspicion that caused anger fear which made them come together in the fight against the british okay now apart from this we have to understand that close links between the sepoys and the countryside the rural areas the villages of northern india existed during this time okay a large majority of sepoys or soldiers indian soldiers in bengal army they were recruited from villages of awadh and eastern uttar pradesh okay many of them were brahmans or they belonged to the upper caste hindus okay so when they heard about when they heard about the cartridges being greased with pig and cow fats they were infuriated they were angry okay because this uh, this hurt their religious sentiments this hurt their customs okay so their fears uh, their fears of the new greased cartridges uh, their grievances their complaints about low pay about no leave all this okay and the misbehavior of the white officers this all made them made them angry and caused them to raise or rise against the british in revolt okay and then as they were becoming angry all right as they were experiencing exploitation as this news of greased cartridges with cow and pig fat spread among the sepoys because they came from villages okay because they came from villages in present day uttar pradesh in present day bihar these news also went uh, and spread uh, reached and spread in their villages from where they came okay so as you can see the sepoys they came mostly from the villages so their uh, their rumors the rumors that were spread their beliefs were also spread to the villages from where they came so as they arose in rebellion against the british uh, the people in the countryside in their villages the villages from where the sepoys came the people there also got angry and they rose in rebellion against the british okay now let us see what why did the uh, why did the rebels why did the sepoys and the farmers the peasants the zamindars and other people rebel it what did they want okay why did they all come together to rebel now the british as victors hated the rebels as bunch of ungrateful and barbarian people when the people indian people rebelled against the british the people the british considered them as ungrateful and barbarian okay now the rebels who took part in the revolt of 1857 they had no opportunity of recording their own versions of events of the risings obviously the british officials have the opportunity they have the sources resources so they write what happened during the 1857 uh, how were the battles fought where all they fought the battle how did they suppress the uh, revolt and the rebellion they write about it they are educated right they write about it but the rebels the indian rebels they did not uh, have they did not have those opportunities they did not have those access because they were not educated okay they were illiterate people so they could not write about their experience they could not write about their grievances their problems they could not write about their dissatisfactions the exploitation okay their experiences Uh, a few proclamations and ishtahars or notifications were uh, issued by rebel leaders to propagate their ideas and enjoined upon the people to join the revolt now although people most of the people were illiterate and they could not write about their experiences about what they felt and why they were fighting against the british but there were some uh, people who could write who could read and what they did they wrote these small uh, pamphlets 
pamphlets. They prepared small pamphlets uh, where they wrote proclamations or ishtahars. These were called ishtahars or notifications, the main points of what they thought, of what they wanted. Okay, so these papers were uh, distributed among the Indians and this uh, was done so that the word of the fight against the British was spread among more and more Indians and they could join the revolt. Okay. But these also, okay, these uh, notifications, these proclamations, they are very little in number and these also do not contain much information about what the rebels felt, what they wanted, okay. So as a result of the lack of the perspective of the rebels, Indian rebels, about the revolt of 1857, we do not have a clear picture of what the rebel wanted, okay. So when we try to understand it, what do we have to do? We have to turn to the British records. We have to turn to the British files and documents to understand that. Okay, to we have we have to turn to the British accounts, accounts written by the British officers, scholars, etc. Okay, to understand the happenings, the events of 1857, to understand the experiences of the um, people, Indian people, and what they wanted from this, uh, from the event of the revolt of 1857. Okay, so that is why this is one of the problems that we face. Okay. Uh, and the problem is that we do not we do not get to properly understand what the rebel wanted uh, from the fight against the British because there's very less or no information about it written by themselves. Okay, all the information that we get are written by the British officers and um, the British scholars. Okay, and they do not tell us what the rebels wanted. They only tell uh, what they want us to know. Okay, they only tell from their perspective, from their point of view. Okay, they do not tell from the point of view of the rebel. So we do not have that understanding. All right. So that is one problem that we face when we try to understand the revolt of 1857. So now let us try to look at the nature of the proclamation of the rebels. So we said that how some of the rebels, they wrote in notifications, they wrote uh, proclamations which was which were distributed among the Indian rebels to bring them together in the fight against the British. Okay, so let's look at them. Now, one of the things that we must understand and remember that these proclamations, they talked about a vision of unity. They encouraged the people for unity. They advocated unity. Okay. So the what was reflected from the proclamation of the rebels is that a vision of unity. Okay. It did not talk separately about Muslims and Hindus fighting on their own way uh, against the British. No. It spoke for the entire people. Okay. So these proclamations, okay, these are small writings, they appealed to all the sections of the Indian society, irrespective of their caste, creed, religion, okay. And the proclamations were issued by Muslim princes, they were issued by uh, not regular people, they were issued by uh, sepoys, etc., Okay, so if the proclamations were issued by the Muslim princes, they made sure that they appealed to the sentiments of the Hindus as well. So the Muslims writing uh, to the people asking for support in the fight against the British, of course, they will write uh, to the, their Muslim community. But in these proclamations, the writings were to both the Hindus and Muslims. All right. Um, so uh, they remained uh, reminded the pre-British Hindu Muslim past and glorified the coexistence of the different communities under the Mughal Empire. So these proclamations they talked about, they told people about how there was harmony between the Muslims and the Hindu communities before the British came under the Mughal rule. 
Okay, so they glorified the coexistence of the Muslims and the Hindus during the Mughal period to tell people that how Muslims and Hindus have to be united to uproot the foreign rule of the British government. Okay, the proclamation issued under the name of Bahadur Shah II appealed to the people to join the rising uh, uprising under the banners of both so the proclamation uh, written by the Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah also spoke to both the Muslims and the Hindus, okay, followers of Muhammad as well as Mahavir, okay, and others as well. So basically what we are trying to understand is that these proclamations, despite being written by the Muslim rulers, were appealed to both the Hindus and Muslims, okay. And now during the uh, during the revolt, there were many instances where divisions were tried to create between the Hindus and the Muslims by the British. Okay, but these attempts went went to vain. Okay, in December 1857, the British government spent 50,000 rupees to incite the Hindus against the Muslims in Bareilly, but their attempt failed. So many such attempts were made by the British government to make the Briti uh, make the uh, Muslims and Hindus fight against each other to break the unity, break the unity that were uh, that that was present between them okay so that they can suppress the revolt quickly and with ease all right now let's look at uh, one of the proclamation which is azamgarh proclamation of 25th august 1857 let's see what this says okay now this proclamation has several sections okay now let's look at each section the first section is regarding the zamindars and it says it is quite clear that British government in making zamindari settlements have imposed exorbitant jumas revenue demand and have disgraced and ruined several zamindars by putting their estates for public auction for areas of rent. So the first section appeals to the zamindars and says how the revenue um, policy of the British government has removed the zamindars from the position that they held before and they their holdings, land holdings, their estates have been taken away okay by the british so because of that because of that the zamindars have to come together to fight against this um, uh, unfair uh, ruler uh, the foreign ruler the british raj okay the second section uh, appeals to the merchants and it says that the british government by monopolizing the trade okay of indigo of uh, cloth and other articles have left the trade of india okay have let have left the trade of india uh, to decline okay and how it has impacted the native merchants all right so because of this the merchants also have to come together to fight against the uh, british the third section appeals to the public servants and it says that in the British government how the employment is provided only to the Europeans. The natives are not provided employment and if they're employed, if they're employed in civil and military service, they are provided little respect, low pay and no manner of influence, all post of dignity and emoluments in both departments have exclusively bestowed on Englishmen. So the public servants are told that most of the higher posts are given to the Englishmen, to the Europeans, and the Indians are given the low ranks. And even if they are recruited, their pay is very less, they are given no respect and they are exploited, they are not uh, behaved properly, they are not treated properly by their, uh, by their British officials and seniors, okay. The fourth section refers to the 
artisans okay the problems faced by the artisans the handloom workers the cottage industry workers right and it says that it is evident that the europeans by the introduction of english articles to india they have thrown out the weavers the cotton dressers the carpenters the blacksmiths and the shoemakers etc out of employment uh, and have engrossed and have made them beggars all right so it it tells the artisans that how with the coming of the british government and with the introduction of british goods in the market the cottage industries the small scale industries have declined and with that the weavers the cotton dressers the carpenters the blacksmiths they have been pushed out of their job okay they have been made jobless because the cottage industries are shut all right and because of that they have now uh, become beggars all right the last section sec uh, section 5 refers to pundits uh, per fakirs and other learned people like for example scholars priests etc okay so these are uh, priests from both the communities hindus and muslims they are said to be the guardians of the hindu and muhammadan religion respectively they are the guardians the priests the scholars the learned people are the guardians of the of their respective religion and the europeans what they are doing they are turning out to be enemies to both these religions okay and they are waging a war against their religion hindus and muslims so the people irrespective of their religion have to come together to fight against this uh, unfair um, uh, unfair rule of the british government okay now let us look at the complaints or the grievances of the sepoys we already saw the grievances of the merchants of the zamindars of the religious heads a sector through the proclamation right of azamgarh now let us see the complaints of the sepoys why were the sepoys unhappy with the british government now one of the petitioners the uh, okay so the sepoys also wrote petitions they also wrote their complaints okay which was spread just like the proclamation so one of the petitions or uh, one of those written uh, complaints have survived and it tells us about the grievances of the sepoys okay so it says we the sepoys and our forefathers have always served the british and have entered their service it is with our assistance that the british conquered every place they liked in which thousands of hindustani men laid down their lives but we have never made any excuse nor revolted but in the years 1857 the british issued an order that new cartridges and muskets have arrived from england the cartridges are coated with the fat of cows and pigs the atta which is given to us for eating is mixed with the powdered bones this these will pollute our faith our faith and religion if the religion of a hindu or muslim is lost what remains in this world so this is one of the petition written by one of the sepoys and this petition as you heard right it tells very clearly why the sepoys were angry they were angry because of the new rule that this new cartridges were to be used and those were uh, coated with fat and cow pigs and the flour which they received to consume uh, those were also mixed with powdered bones of uh, both the beasts okay of both cows and pigs now they said that by uh, such by consumption of such atta and also use of such cartridges that was to pollute the faith of both the muslims and the hindus right and this had angered the sepoys all right so this was the main complaint the sepoys felt that the british were now attacking their faith attacking their religion attacking their faith attacking their custom okay so that angered that caused the uh, sepoys to come together and revolt against their british masters okay
So the proclamation rejected all things associated with the British rule. Okay, the proclamation, it rejected everything that was connected, associated, linked with the British rule. They severely condemned all the annexations of territories, capture of territories of the native rulers and the treaties they had broken. The rebel leaders said that the British were not trustworthy people. Okay, so now the uh, people who rebelled, they were against the uh, against everything which was associated with the British government and the British rule. They were against the annexation and capture of the kingdoms of the native rulers. And they said, okay, they said very clearly that the British was, the British were not trustworthy people and they had to now uh, be removed, uprooted, okay. Now the people were angry because the British had introduced new land revenues and with that they had disposed the landlords. They had ruined the artisans and weavers of the cottage industries. Okay, So they attacked every aspect of the British rule. Okay, uh, They felt that the British government was trying to destroy the way of life which they lived, which they had lived for centuries and which they cherished. Okay. And they were very anxious. Now the rebels, uh, the, the people revolting were very keen to now get rid of this Firangi rule or the foreign rule and restore their earlier rule, the Mughal rule. Okay, their early rulers, uh, they wanted to bring back the rule of, they wanted to bring back their rulers. Okay, they wanted to go back to the earlier way of life. Now, uh, the proclamation expressed widespread fear that British had planned to destroy the caste and religions of the Hindus and Muslims. So the proclamations which were spread among the people that also told people that the British government was determined to destroy the caste and religion of both the Hindus and Muslims. They were now trying to convert the Indians to Christianity. Now this fear which was was instilled in the paper, uh, which was instilled in the minds of the of the people. They now they turned into anger. They turned into now desire to uh, desire for people to come together and to fight against the British for what to save their faith, to save their customs, to save their livelihood, their honor and identity. Okay, so when the re uh, rebellion took place, when the people revolted against the British, it was a fight against the foreign rule for the greater public good, for the public good of the people, so that the foreign rule can be removed and then the old rule can be restored. All right. So during the uprising of the 1857, when some of the places uh, were, uh, when, when in some of the places the uh, the people, the native rebels, the Indian rebels, when they were able to, uh, when they were able to capture those areas, now in places like Lucknow, Kanpur, where initially they were able to recapture it from the British officers. So there they tried to set up a structure of authority and administration of their own okay but this uh, although they set it up but they only remained for a short period of time okay but what this showed was that the people were now very keen they were desirous to restore the pre-british world of the 18th century now they wanted to do away with the british administration do away with the british system they wanted to restore the pre-british the system which existed in the 18th century before the british came okay they turned to the culture of the mughal court so the kind of setup that they did while they captured uh, delhi Lakhon, now Kanpur for a small amount of time they practiced the culture of the Mughal court okay so they made appointments for the collection of land revenue and they made arrangements for payments to the soldiers okay they issued orders to end loot and plunder at the same time they made plans uh, to fight against the British so these were the changes that they brought even if that lasted for a short amount of period okay
So by setting up this kind of system, what they were doing was they were trying to go back to the 18th century Mughal system, a system that existed before the British consolidated its power in India. Okay, so 18th century Mughal world had become a symbol of all that had been lost. Okay, so they felt that with the coming of the British, with the British rules establishment in India, everything that they had earlier was lost. Okay, so now by fighting the British in 1857, by revolting against the British and fighting and defeating the British, what they had to do, they had to now go back to the old world of 18th century and restore the old system. Okay, which had been lost as a result of the coming up of coming of the British rule in India. Okay.